name is Tiffany Tucker. Um, I am a MFA candidate in creative nonfiction at the university. I'm also a fellow at the Center for Afrofuture Studies, and I'll be in conversation with the wonderful Sonia Dyer today. So before I get started, I do have a little introduction on Sonia to tell you how wonderful she is. <laughs> So Sonia is a writer and occasional curator from London and is a Somerset House Studios resident. Sonia's performative, interdisciplinary, and research-based practice utilizes dialogical platforms, reproductive technologies, and moving image, exploring how subjectivities and alliances are formed across cultures and temporalities. She runs the and Beyond Institute for Future research, a parapectic think tank, creating possible futures, hailing frequencies open, her body of work, intersex, Michelle Nichols, astronaut recruitment activism, the, the, the dubious genesis of the HeLa cells, and the Greek myth of Andromeda, combining social justice with speculation, fantasy with the political, Dyer is a previous arts admin, artist, bursary scheme recipient, and was a 2011-2012 Whitney Museum of American Art Independent Study Program Fellow, and she is currently co-artistic advisor for Syllabus 4. Yes. So you're great. <laughs> Good summing up in a word. Okay, so, First, um, can you talk a little bit more about Hailing Frequencies Open, right? <coughs> like the inspiration, what the project is? Thank you. Um, before I do that, uh, I just wanted to thank um, you all for coming, and thank CAS as well, the Center for Afrofuture Studies. Um, I've only been here for a week, but it's been a really amazing week. Uh, it feels like longer. I know all the bus drivers now on my route from <laughs> where I'm staying to here. And special thank you to Camille and John and to Avi who is in here with us, and also to Tiffany as well, who's really helped to organize everything. Um, so, Hailing Frequencies Open really kind of comes out of the fact that I am a nerd who loves science fiction, and I've always loved science fiction. And I'm interested in, uh, in science fiction as a vehicle to kind of grapple with some contemporary anxieties. Um, particularly, this project takes three kind of starting points. So the first one is mentioned is Nichelle Nichols, who played Uhura in Star Trek, um, this little known history of her activism within NASA to diversify the astronaut pool, um, particularly in terms of actually recruiting women um, astronauts who were actually sent into space. So, for example, Sally Ride, who was the first American woman in space, came through Nichelle Nichols' program. Um, the first African American man who went into space came through Nichelle Nichols' program. Um, so I'm interested in the way that she kind of weaponized her status as a nerd goddess to change, <laughs> basically, to change the face of NASA. She made them do it, you know? Um, the second point is this um, story of the healer cells, which is represented in the videos. Essentially, um, this, these cells were stolen from the body of a young African-American mother and farmer called Henrietta Lacks, um, without her knowledge and consent. And the reason why they were seen as being so remarkable is that they are what they call immortal cells which means that they continuously reproduce themselves. They reproduce themselves in all kinds of situations and circumstances. And there was, this was something that had never been seen before within the sciences. Um, so there's a whole kind of dubious story about how those cells were then monetized within biomedical research industry, um, which has made you know, billions upon billions from these cells. Um, but very little of that has trickled down to her family. Um, but interestingly for my research, um, healer cells were also the first human material sent into space. And they were sent into space by the Soviets in around 1960. Um, they were sent in various ways. They were sent when they were sending dogs out to space. They were sent some healer cells along as well. And also they were sent up with Yuri Gagarin during his first um, space missions. Um, so I basically posit that human space travel begins with Henrietta Lacks, that she is a progenitor of human space travel. 
Um, the third point is the, um, the Greek myth of Andromeda. So within Greek mythology, Andromeda was an Ethiopian princess. Her parents were the rulers of Ethiopia, and her mother basically said that her daughter was the most beautiful girl in the known world, which really pissed off the Greek gods. And so they decided to ravish Ethiopia, kidnap Andromeda, and they chained her to a rock. And in the story, um, there's still a sea monster out against her, and Perseus comes in as the hero and rescues her. And what particularly interests me um, about this story is not even so much that she's Ethiopian, because in the ancient world, they didn't really have this concept of race that we have now. Um, so there, was, there were plenty of like African Greeks or African Romans or what have you. Um, but within art history, Andromeda is always depicted as being white and European, which is kind of ironic, bearing in mind the whole story is about her being this Ethiopian. Um, but Andromeda is also the name of a galaxy in a star constellation. So effectively, what I'm doing with Hanging Frequencies Open is creating this um, kind of science fiction inspired epic uh, wherein the healer cells who were, that were sent into space um, are still in space and are heading towards Andromeda. So Andromeda becomes this kind of potential refuge for not only the cells themselves, but this idea of kind of bodily abjection. Um, I would say also, um, so this vessel, this kind of prototype vessel that I um, created here um, is named Anarka. Um, one of the reasons why I use that name is because if you heard of J. Marion Sims, so he is regarded as the father of gynecology. Um, he um, is, uh, has become a controversial figure, rightly, because there are numerous statues um, of his likeness around your country. Um, but he, his experiments were conducted on the bodies of enslaved women without any kind of anesthetic or pain relief or any kind of care for their humanity at all. And so there were three women in particular who were known to have been experimented on by Sims, uh, Anaka, Betsy, and Lucy. And so as I see the projects at the moment, I will name my vessels after these three women. So it's partly about kind of reclaiming their, um, their humanity, but also making their, mon monumentalizing their name to the point where they become sites of potentially revolutionary activity. That was a very long explanation, but. <laughs> um, and the next question was how would you describe the prototype vessel, but I think also covered, unless you wanted to say a little bit more about it. I was inspired by really early Soviet space vessels um, that were kind of like tubes with bits sticking on them, uh, round things on them, um, but quite kind of modernist geometric shapes. But also, I kind of, I'm attracted to randomness. So these um, instruments at the top are just called sophisticated instruments. <laughs> um, because that was the best way I could describe how I imagine them operating. Um, <laughs> you know, in a very sophisticated fashion. Um, but the idea is that essentially the healer cells live there, and then they're kind of reproducing down, but they reproduce everywhere because that's what they do. But you kind of get new healer cells here coming up, and then they'll kind of escape into the next iteration of their existence. But also, I like the idea of this being something that, if it were to exist, would be microscopic in size. So this is like a huge um, uh, blow up of what it could be, because we're talking about cells, which are tiny. So it wouldn't need to be this kind of huge, huge vessel. As the project develops over the next several years, the prototypes for the vessels will change. And they'll change as a result of how I imagine the cells um, evolving. So I'm kind of, you know, telling these, I'm creating characters out of these cells in a way. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a bit more about what I was thinking of with this. They look like the, what are these, like the sophisticated? Oh. Sophisticated like, instruments. Yes, yeah. sophisticated instruments. Okay, so how did you come to this term, dark fecundity? Okay. Yeah, um, and what are you referring to when you use it? Thank you. So um, I, um, I'm doing a PhD and I've taken this year off. And when you do a PhD, you have to kind of come up with original thoughts, otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Um, but I've been thinking a lot about how like, the black female body within so-called Western cultures, um, my own as well as the culture here, is often seen as a site of, kind of uncontrollability. 
um, and this is at the heart of a lot of um, racist violence that, that, that women in particular experience, but this idea that, um, for example, with the healer cells, you know, that they, they reproduce and they don't stop reproducing um, the way in which um, black mothers are often talked about within the press and so on. Um, and I've been looking at a lot of reports about um, the behavior of healer cells in space. So some of the cells, nothing much happens, but a lot of the cells um, reproduce even faster. And there's a line from a scientist that's really struck with me. Um, he says, healer became more powerful. So the idea that it, once the cells went into space, they became even more powerful and they reproduced at an even faster rate. Um, so the darkness, you know, is a kind of double-edged thing. Um, could be in terms of um, complexion, but also in terms of um, coming out of a, a kind of social situation that is not um, designed for you to advance within. But also the fecundity is, is this idea of this extreme fertility, this, um, this uncontrollability, and kind of seeing that as a, as a superpower rather than as something to disparage. Um, I wanted to kind of flip, flip the meaning of the way in which those terms are utilized um, in ref with reference to black bodies in particular. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so a lot of the videos feature, I mean, both of the videos feature your conversation with Dr. Hadaya Nicole Green. So could you talk a little bit more about um, how you came across her work and why you wanted to work with her for this project? Thank you. Yeah, so one of the most exciting um, aspects of being here was that Castle really opened to me, to put me in touch with scientists and um, I, when I, during the conversation with um, Dr. Green this week, I was saying to her that, you know, I'm going to spend the next few years of my life just like talking to black women scientists about science fiction. And I can't believe this is what I do in my life now. It's so cool. So I tend to kind of study black women and like study what we're doing in the world. Um, and so I came across Dr. Green's work because I was looking up um, like innovative um, black women scientists. Um, the idea, I guess, throughout the duration of this project is that I almost create a kind of, I see it as almost like a Greek chorus of these women scientists um, who in some way contextualize certain parts of the project. Um, and I'm interested in exploring the space between like science and science fiction, because I've been really struck by how many scientists love science fiction um, and how science fiction kind of sparks certain parts of their imagination. Um, so a few weeks ago, I was very fortunate to be as part of a talk with an amazing um, space uh, space architect called um, Dr. In no, Barbara Imhoff, um, who's Austrian, and she designs architectural structures for future space missions. Um, and so, um, again, having the opportunity to talk to Dr. Green, who is developing um, through her um, Aura Lee um, Foundation developing um, a very unique type of laser t for cancer treatment. And um, there's some information around uh, about the work that she's doing. But I was really interested in the fact that you know, healer cells have become the kind of gold standard for scientific research. And I wanted to kind of get a sense of her relationship to the cells and also her interest in science fiction. And what was really fascinating and moving to me is that Dr. Green refuses to use healer cells. Um, because of the, um, the political ramifications of using them, because they were stolen, because the family isn't being compensated, which is what she discusses in the video that's just directly in front of where I am now. Um, and I, it never occurred to me that um, a scientist might re refuse to use them. Um, so there's something really powerful about the power of no, saying no to certain orthodoxies um, that I find really, really interesting. Um, and also in the second video, she talks about <coughs> I love science fiction, how science fiction to her is basically physics. Um, and that's something that I'm really interested in kind of delving deeper into with her and with other scientists in the future as well. Yeah, that video and what you just said made me wonder like how other scientists um, rationalize continuing to use the cells on like a ethics level. Mm -hmm. Like you know how they would on a scientific level, but how do they reconcile it ethically? Mm -hmm. So interesting. Um, do you want to have another question? Yeah. 
I have another question. Unless you have something else you want to say. Okay. Thank you so much. And now we're going to open up to the audience for questions. All right, so if you have a question that you would like to ask Sonia, now is the time. I, I'd love a response to the question that you just posed, actually. Do you, did you talk to scientists who did explain why they continue to use the cells, what the actual question is? Um, I haven't yet had the opportunity to do that, so this is really the second conversation I've had with scientists. But from what I've read, I understand that it's basically just an orthodoxy, it's just what people do. And there are so many things that take place because it's just what people do. You know, as if there's no agency or no choice. Um, so I'm really interested to see how many of the other people I, I talk to just use, it without, use them without thinking. Because, um, yeah, I mean, get away with so much just because that's what people do. Um, so yeah, it'd be interesting to find out. I'm really struck by, yet again, I'm reminded by your observations about how deeply uh, race is implicated in everything that we do. And yet, there's this uh, overwhelming desire to immediately, quote unquote, transcend race you know, in, in every discourse. So, you know, science and medical research is supposed to be you know, objective and disinterested, and yet, if you know, um, when when you go to a gynecologist, you're dealing with the history of race every time you visit your gynecologist, right? Uh, who knows what medical treatments I received that have been a result of Henrietta Lacks? You know, but 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 again, the discourse is always that race is a very narrow way of thinking about the world. And yet, it is implicated in every single thing that we do, period, across the board. It's spatialized, it's embedded in material, it's about uh, you know, moving from one geographical zone to another, or if you, whether that's across country, across the world, or uh, across town, right? Uh, the other thing is kind of a question, right? And that is, have you seen the ad for this TV show about going to Mars? It's been, it's, been, it's been looped a lot. And, and one, they're talking to people about going to Mars. And one of the things that one of the people, I don't know who it is because I haven't paid attention, but I hear this line over and over, it's like, it's just there for the taking. Mm -hmm. That's the discourse around going to Mars, that it's just there for the taking. But that's exactly what the calculus, when this land was there for the taking, right? That's the same thought process. Um, I haven't seen that show. I think maybe it's in my Netflix queue. Is it like a kind of semi-documentary, semi... Yeah, semi, semi and uh, not semi, all, all, it's semi-documentary and all cheesy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it's something worth deconstructing. I, if I find a reference, I, I'll find a contact. Thank you. Yeah. To my mind, if humanity is still talking about colonizing places, we shouldn't go anywhere. Yes. Okay? Because colonization is death. Yes. Um, and there may well be other life forms that we don't have the capacity to recognize as life forms out there as well. Um, so one of the things that the, um, Dr. Imhoff was talking about was how, I think it's one of the moons of Pluto or something, that um, there's a plan to kind of drill all the way through the planet to the core because I think there might be some life or water there. And I kind of said, well, can you imagine some superior beings coming here and like drilling through the earth just to see what's down there? Mm. You know, there's the lack of kind of empathetic thinking, I think. So as long as our species still thinks like this, we should stay here and fix our shit. <laughs> <You know? laughs> as much as I would love to go to space. But in terms of your previous point about race, you know, I'm aware that I'm from another place that has its own um, history of colonization, um, enslavement and so on. But I know that when I come here, um, I, I kind of need to listen more than I speak because as soon as I open my mouth, whoever I'm talking to knows I'm an African American and I know that I'm treated very differently. I'm sorry, what's the, what I'm, I'm treated very differently. Oh yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Immediately, on like a different level, oh, yeah. we drove mm-hmm. together. There's a packing order here. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and that's very disturbing to experience. Yeah. Um, but I do think that, I don't think it's necessarily the world. I think sometimes, particularly in such a large country as this one, there can be a conversation between the world and like the West. Uh, I think, you know, my family is from Jamaica, and it's a very different thing to being here or being in England. Um, and you know, in different African countries and so on. Um, but I do think that within the kind of what we're calling the Western world, um, the recent history of racial violence and racial injustice and genocide and enslavement, of course, affects every single thing. Um, it's the foundation. It's the foundation stone um, of a country such as this because there were you know indigenous people living here who, you know, still having difficulty voting in 2018. Um, and I think uh, one of the most fascinating aspects of the, the Monuments Must Fall movement that's quite international, actually, is the way in which there is this reluctance to deal with real history, uh, to deal with the factual information we have access to. Um, there was a, a political conversation recently in Britain because the leader of the Labour Party, he's like, the Labour Party is effectively your Democrats, but your Democrats are really conservative compared to other parties. Yes. Um, so, you know, they're, like, they're actual socialists and they're not afraid to use that word. Um, but the leader of the Labour Party kind of said that, you know, he supported a move to adjust the curriculum so that school children learn more about actual colonial atrocities. Because really what you learn in school is that Britain ended the slave trade. For real. For real. Um, so, um, but uh, there was a kind of outcry, you know, our children shouldn't be taught this, you know, we shouldn't be putting this into their minds. Like, our children shouldn't be taught the truth about what we did. Because if they knew the truth, we might be able to continue doing what we're doing. That's essentially what it is. So I, I, I completely agree with you that it does permeate everything, but I think also there's an the intersection of class and gender and so on that um, maybe doesn't get as much attention here as it does on the other side of the pond. You know, we have a monarchy, so class for me is everything. Um, and that, so I think it's you know it's part of a, a nuanced conversation. But um, but yeah, absolutely. How could it not? You know, until until we really grapple with you know history as is, it will always be um, that kind of unspoken thing that is that is there. And sometimes it is more than that. Sometimes it's very much in your face. Um, and it's where that I keep coming to the Midwest during your election cycles. So I was in Omaha during the election in 2016, and I was here at this time. So I'm having a very interesting <laughs> experience of this part of your country. What, you, you mentioned an international monuments. What does that look like in other spaces? South Africa has a big movement. I think actually it kind of began in South Africa because a lot of the statues of um, of people who were quite instrumental in the apartheid era, um, or kind of pre-apartheid, you know, different colonizers. In the UK, um, certainly there's a lot that's been going on in universities, in particular Oxford and Cambridge, those really um, well-known universities that have a long legacy because so many of the monuments there are named after people who were involved with the slave trade. Many of Britain's most um, wealthiest cities um, cities with beautiful Georgian architecture, Bristol, places like that, Liverpool. Um, the entire wealth of those cities was based around one way or another enslavement. So this is part of this kind of reckoning with history that, that Britain is. is um, now Britain's been a multi-racial place for a long time, but um, hasn't necessarily been a multicultural place for an equally long time. There were African Romans who conquered Britain. You know. So we've been there for 2,000 years, on and off. But um, this is part of a kind of very, I think, necessary um, conversation that needs to take place. And it's kind of almost like a, a battle between those you want to forget and those you want to remember. So it's really interesting to see it being played out. But what I'm interested in is in the act of monumentalizing. So what happens when you name something after someone? The act of monumentalizing itself isn't the problem. It's really about thinking critically who is monumentalized and how, um, and what that, um, what that act actually means. 
You talked about, about the fact that the, the Lax family wasn't compensated for the use of the cells. And you also talked about how the cells um, were sort of almost a figure for, for this, this concept of the black female body as being uncontainable and uncontrollable. And why is the figure that you're choosing to focus on a figure of sending the lax cells somewhere else to like potentially replicate on some planet that happens to have enough elements to be able to replicate versus focusing on, on Earth you know, restructuring the politics so that reparations are paid to the family. Like, why is it about sending outward rather than structuring and re redressing the, the lacks of the past? Um, and then the inside the story, like, where where is the is the uh, uh, anarcha going, and who sent it? I am not interested in making work that's about. Um, reparative justice for the Lax family. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that I don't think there needs to be reparative justice mm -hmm. for the Lax family, but that's not the focus of my attention. Sure. Um, I make work that's about the future right. and the future is. Right. Um, so that's, that's where my interests lie. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that any kind of reproduction of the story of Henrietta Lax and herself is part of a broader effort to um, to make sure that she is not forgotten. Mm -hmm. And I think in particular, um, to reinvigorate this, this lesser known history of her role in space travel is a really important part of that. Mm -hmm. um, but the kind of activist work that you're describing is not what I do. I'm not an activist. Um, and I'm also not, um, I just don't make work in that, in that vein. Um, so what's the second part of your question about Oh, well, where are you sending this? So essentially, as um, Tiffany mentioned before, um, I have this think tank called the And Beyond Institute for Future Research, and within the kind of world that I'm building with the work that I'm making, it's the institute that is um, facilitating the journey of the healer cells towards the Andromeda galaxy, which is a, a huge galaxy and we don't know what's there. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea is that actually, because the cells have already been sent out into space, mm -hmm. that it's we're essentially facilitating um, their desire to head towards Andromeda because of the story that I told you earlier within Greek mythology. So again, it's about kind of reclaiming uh, or reimagining um, this story of Andromeda, which has been um, transformed into within art history, which my work sits within as I make visual art. Um, been transformed into a story about you know this kind of young blonde maiden mm -hmm. who was treated horribly by the Greek gods, mm -hmm. whereas actually it's about the ravishing of an entire country because you can't handle her mother saying that mm -hmm. she's the most beautiful girl. Most mothers think that about their daughters, right? There's a lot of more impulse. So it's really about um, that kind of act of reclamation on, on different levels as well. I don't know if that fully answers your question. I think that answers most components of it, yeah. I, I, there's some futurism that, that, that says, you know, how can we structure our future society in the future? And there's some futurism that says, how can we build societies elsewhere? And but I, I think you can, I don't think those two things are necessarily separate, mm -hmm. because science fiction is metaphorical. Right. And invariably, it's about addressing contemporary anxieties. It's about addressing the things that, that challenge us now. Um, that's what it's really about. I mean, if you look at, you know, something like, something we all know, like Star Trek. Okay, so you had like, two Jewish men as leads just after World War II. Mm -hmm. You know, most of the superheroes that were familiar with Superman and so on were created by Jewish writers mm -hmm. in this country who are the immigrants and children of immigrants. Mm -hmm. So wanted to create someone who is strong and morally upright mm -hmm. in light of, you know, Nazi Germany. It's, a, it's an understandable impulse. Um, but I think also, you know, you have the story of the interracial kiss, for example, sure. which could only happen because Captain Kirk was possessed <laughs> by somebody, you know, right? It had to be some kind of irrationality. Um, and there's a really interesting um, interview I read with, with um, William Shatner where he talks about how upset it was, like, mm -hmm. Michelle Nichols is absolutely beautiful, why would I want to kiss her, you know? Um, so there's always a, a, a sense of dealing with the now, but through storytelling, and human beings have always, sorry, that's me, have always um, dealt with our anxieties through storytelling. Like every human culture does that. That's you know, that's the basis of most religions. It's like stories that are repeated through generations. So I just see what I'm thinking about in that kind of not that I'm creating a religion, but that um, 
that kind of thinking about visual storytelling, but also kind of broader narratives and world building as a kind of central component of, of speculative fiction. Vera, did you have a? I'll give it to my partner. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. My question could be a good ender, but it's just, what is the most hopeful work of science fiction you've encountered so far in your research that offers us an ender? Oh, wow, Pharaoh, what are you doing? <laughs> 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 I'll ask this question, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know if I've come across it yet, to be honest. Um, I think there are, uh, do you know Octavia Butler? Yeah. Okay, so she wrote these series of books called the Parables. So it's Parables of the Soul and Parables of the Other One. <laughs> which is basically kind of starting now where there's a kind of president who is a bit of a demagogue and democracy starts to kind of crumble and then you know basically there's this young african-american woman who creates this new community and this new way of living um, and out of that kind of arises a, a future civilization um, so I, I love those kinds of books as well but I don't I don't know if there is I don't know if I yet know of one that is as kind of utopian as your question suggests, but I think that I'm interested in the books that are really grappling with how to do what you've just suggested, so how to make society different, how to reimagine where we might live together, um, particularly dealing with, yes, earth things, but also dealing with other species, which is really about dealing with other cultures. And I'm also, um, at the moment, watching the entire series of Star Trek Voyager. What's interesting to me about Voyager is that it's a group of people who expected to be away for two weeks and then find themselves like 70 years away from home. So all of a sudden they're forced to deal with that. how did I build a community that didn't intend to become a community? Now dealing with the possibility of being a generational ship that they may not, the ones who start won't see it through to the end. So they have to like have children, and they'll train them how to have children. Like just kind of thinking through how they actually build a society. Like what do we do if people fall in love? Like how do we handle these kinds of things? Like these really sticky things that we never expected because we were only supposed to be away for two weeks. Um, and so what's really interesting to me about that is um, is just watching this kind of this crew of people, half of whom were like rebels who were fighting them beforehand, like try and find a way towards community. And I think that's very, I mean, all Star Trek is utopian, but it's a very utopian endeavor because they're never expected to be in that position. It's not like people who plan to go to Mars, you know, they just thought they'd be away for two weeks. Um, so that's my answer <coughs> now, but if you ask me again in two years, I'll probably have another answer. Well, I hope I have the opportunity to actually yeah, sure, sure. So the futurist dimension that I haven't heard you talk about yet of your project, but I feel like it has to be there, is just sending cells into space. And the, one of the coolest things that cells do is mutate and evolve. So is there an evolutionary pathway in your mind for these black cells? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, so I tend to work on projects for a very long time. So I imagine working on this for another maybe four to five years. Um, ultimately, I'm creating a series of films, but also objects and videos and these ongoing interviews with the scientists and so on. Um, so this is just like a prototype for the first vessel, but I think through the way that I'm imagining the cells mutating, the vessels will require, they'll require different vessels, basically, and they may themselves become the vessel. Um, uh, and I'm also kind of thinking through like creating action figures based on the cells as they mutate <laughs> and like what what that might look like and you know the idea of making an extra figure that doesn't have limbs um <laughs> and just i think it would take me a few years to work it out but this is like a 3d printed thing i think um so yeah absolutely um they mutate some rebel some want to go off and do other things that how this is why i think it's really good for me to watch voyage like how how does, it, how does this happen how does this and what does it actually mean when these things happen. Um, you know, and I also think about things like, um, are you familiar with Marcus Garvey, his kind of Black Star Line um, idea of, you know, putting together a shipping company that would send the descendants of enslaved people back to um, Africa, West Africa, and just the shenanigans <coughs> that went on around that, and just all these examples that we have existing of attempts to um, 
make new worlds. You know, thinking about a country like Sierra Leone, which was you know, created as a place for um, the descendants of former enslaved people to return to, but what they actually brought with them was white supremacy, just with brown faces. So you get kind of caste system based on coloration and things like that. So how do you imagine a new way of living that doesn't do all those things? I, I don't have an answer yet, but that's mm -hmm. what I'm effectively working through. I was just wondering, like, they obviously aren't her anymore, but do the cells have personalities? Like, are they individuals? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I think they become, they gain um, personality throughout the duration of the project. Um, I'm also thinking about things like Planet of the Apes. I love Planet of the Apes. But the way in which, you know, you had, um, the kind of way it kind of shows it, an evolution of um, a species, but also a devolution of humanity. So humans having to, you know, learn how to communicate again, and so on. So I'm, I'm thinking a lot about the way in which speculative fiction um, creates this sense of beginnings and endings and new formations. Um, so I imagine that, yeah, the cells will, you know, leaders will emerge, and you know, things will kind of have to be negotiated. Um, exactly what form that would take really just requires time for me to, to work on. But that's how I envisage it working out. Which part of the age? <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about it as an entire body of work. Okay. Um, even the new ones, the new ones are <laughs> in the same <laughs> Of course, I'm talking about the Charlton Heston. Okay. Yeah. Charlton Heston's a really interesting character. Yeah, okay. He used to be a you know, very active civil rights activist, right. and then he became like an RA. Yeah. I'm really interested in that. But um, even the new ones, I think, had something fascinating going on about this kind of the inherent violence of humanity that we talked about previously today. Um, this this kind of the encounter with something new leading to fear, which leads to violence as an automatic um, impulse, which I don't necessarily know is a universal human thing. I don't think it is. Um, I read a quote the other day uh, from Christopher Columbus, and he talked about um, his encounter with the Native Americans, and he was saying, oh, these people are just like, it'd be so easy for us to screw over because they just want to share stuff. So I don't necessarily think that that is universally human. <laughs> I think that's quite specific um, mentality, but it, mentalities also get transported, you know. So we'll see. I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more about your own, you know, approach as an artist to the idea of creativity. Does its genesis start in dark, quiet spaces, or? Ooh, that's such a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think, actually, one of my dearest friends, Savinda, said to me a few years ago, and it stuck with me. So she said that you always, you always come up with ideas. And I hadn't realized that was a thing that people noticed, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I'm always, I'm always working. I used to have terrible insomnia, um, because my mind was always kind of working away at some idea or something. I've had to really kind of train myself to like sleep and have you no, know, my doctor calls sleep hygiene, you like, don't have screens and all this whole thing that I have to do. But um, I tend to spend a lot of time researching. I don't quite know where it's going, but I know it's going somewhere. So for me, it's about walking towards the thing, even though I don't know where I'm going, and letting the thing walk towards me. And also being really open to what I thought that I was doing, not being the thing that I'm doing. Um, so when I first started to develop this idea of the, of the institute and having this think tank, because I'm interested in the think tank because if you call yourself a think tank, you can get away with stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you can kind of make all kinds of statements and it becomes true because you're a think tank. Um, but I imagine it being like a space program where there would be like human women going to space and that's how I thought I was kind of working it out. But then as I got deeper into the healing cells, which really happened when I did the residency at BMS in Omaha two years ago, um, I had a brilliant intern called Tana who did some amazing research. I thought actually, I don't want the body involved with this. Like, what's really what I'm interested in is the cells. Um, 
and the stars can become metaphors for various things. So I think what I tend to do is just to allow myself to surprise myself, but also I really need like time and I need like financial stability. Um, because I think often, you know, artists, well not just artists, but only speak as an artist, you know, you often have to deal with a lot of precarity and that, that isn't, for me, a very creative energy because I spend too much time worrying or working really hard to get money. So I think that having time and space, I have a studio now which I didn't have before, that's changed everything, um, and coming to places like this where I have not only a studio, but like great people who are facilitating it and a really welcoming environment just means that I could do in a week what something that might have taken me much longer to do had I not come here. Um, so it tends to, I think as I'm working on this in particular, because this is a very ambitious project in terms of where it's headed and the, um, the technical and financial requirements of taking it to where it needs to go, it means I've had to be much more mindful of how I work and what I need. Um, and what I found is by doing that and by going for the things that I really want, a lot of things are now coming to me as well. Um, and things that are actually the stuff that, you know, I have this thing at the new year where I kind of think about what I want to do that year and what kind of stuff. I believe in all of it. Um, and, you know, everything that I kind of really wanted to happen with, in terms of the opportunities for me to develop this project, it was all kind of coming into place. Um, not through kind of magical thinking, but just through very concentrated effort in particular directions, and then kind of meeting the opportunities halfway. So I think it, it for me, it's it's an evolving. It's a very long answer again. I'm sorry. It's, a, it's like an evolving process, and I'm still learning about it. But I think having having the opportunity to to really focus for me is is the key thing. And nighttime is a generative. I, see, I don't know, you know. I used to think this, but I think, I think it was just a bad habit. So that now, when I go to the studio, I leave, I don't leave after seven. You know, um, I treat it like I'm going in, I work, I go home. Because I think then it becomes, then it's almost like a reason for my insomnia, and actually I just don't want to be an insomnia. So I should just stop working at this now. Um, but I, certainly in terms of like thinking things through, yeah, night time was a great time, or just sitting on the bus, or, you know, sometimes I have a lot of post-its around the place, and you know, you get in the middle of the night, and you scribble this thing down, and then you hope that you can read it when you wake up the next morning. Um, but just kind of not having too much, you have to worry about, you know, 